views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough as well as New York City. Coming up, we're going to update you on the latest as we continue to navigate through the coronavirus pandemic. Afterwards, we're also going to speak to New York State Senator Jose Serrano of the 29th Senatorial District. He's going to let us know about some initiatives he's taking to provide more testing centers to residents within his district. And then after that, we're going to sit down with two organizations discussing how they're providing assistance to families during the pandemic. Well, later, we're going to learn how social distancing has played an impact on relationships. We'll be joined by relationship expert Shante Dunbar. And then after that, it's easy to become discouraged. However, we'll discuss how a person can actually maintain perseverance during this time. And then we'll learn about the online services provided by PSS Circle of Care as they support older adults and family caregivers. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way because right now we're officially open. And hello, everyone. I'm Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, April 29th, and we want to thank you for joining us here on Open, where we bring you the news, the information, and the things that matters. We also want to welcome all of our viewers who are sharing with us on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on the MNN's channels. You can stay connected to us here on BronxNet, on all of our social media platforms, at BronxNet Television. Well, a lot has certainly gone on through the course of this past week. We're going to take you through a few things with our Bronx updates. The CDC has officially linked new symptoms in regards to COVID-19. Previously, the agency had listed fever, cough, and shortness of breath or difficulty breathing as symptoms to watch for. Now, according to the CDC, people with COVID-19 have had a wide range of symptoms reported, ranging from mild to severe illness. These new symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, as well as chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell. Now, the symptoms may last between two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. Well, in other news, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is making news, announcing steps that the city is taking to restart the economy and rebuild a fairer New York. The goal is not to go back to the status quo, but to spur a recovery, confronting deep inequities, reaching every neighbor and leaving New York stronger than ever. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio stated, quote, this crisis is not only about a virus, it's about the fallout from hundreds of thousands of our neighbors losing their jobs and struggling to provide for their families. It's about the outsized devastation communities of color are facing across the country. I'm not only calling for New Yorkers from all walks of life to help us to get our city back on our feet, I'm calling on them to join me in the fight ahead for a fair recovery, end quote. Well, the city's decisions in the coming weeks will be determined by the health indicators tracked every day and will, and will evaluate gradual changes and restrictions as daily health metrics indicate the virus has reached the low-level transmission phase. Well, in other news, the state is closely monitoring other things as New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo announced the phased plan to quote-unquote unpause New York. The CDC has put forward guidance that has said that the state can begin to reopen if hospitalization rates 
have declined for 14 days. The state is closely monitoring the hospitalization rate, the infection rate, and the number of positive antibody tests, as well as the overall public health impact and the adjustments to the plan and other decisions based on these indicators. Now, the governor informed New York will reopen in phases to ensure the state, or I should say the safety of our residents, phase one, including open construction and manufacturing functions with low risk. Phase two will open certain industries based on priority and risk levels as businesses are considered more essential with inherent low risk of infection in the workplace and of low risk to customers will be prioritized, followed by other businesses considered less essential or those that present a higher risk of infection spread. And of course, Bronx will continue to cover all the recent developments with the coronavirus pandemic, as well as the state's plans to reopen and softly get to that place. Well, that's all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We want you to stay tuned with us. Coming up after the break, we've got a New York State Senator talking about Bronx initiatives to help those affected with COVID-19. State Senator Jose Serrano will join us right after this. Welcome back here to Open. Darren Jaime here with you. New York City continues to expand its testing here in regards to the COVID-19 virus. The death rate for New Yorkers even more staggering when it comes to communities of color. If you want a more spe specific uh, look at statistics, in New York City, Hispanics account for 34% of COVID-19 fatalities, but only make up about 29% of the population, while African Americans make up 28% of fatalities, but they're only 22% of the population. You're here now to share a little bit more about information regarding the disparities. He is New York State Senator of the 29th Senatorial District, Jose Serrano. And thank you so much for joining us, Senator Serrano, for being with us and sharing about this very important matter. Thank you so much for having me. This is really you know, very difficult, troubling times. I'm, I'm glad to see that you're uh, still out there doing your show. And thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be with you. No, glad to have you. And so let's get right into it. When we talk about these numbers, I just shared the numbers in the lead about, you know, how communities of color are making up the, the, the gross number of fatalities here in New York City, but yet and still don't make up a predominance within the population. So first of all, just your thoughts to that. Well, I, it's it's very disheartening. Now, the issue with health disparities, they've existed long before COVID-19, and it's been a troubling reality in communities of color, like the ones that I represent here in the South Bronx, where you have these ongoing sort of systemic uh, racial disparities, ethnic disparities when it comes to health care uh, and health outcomes, and as it pertains to chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension. Um, and there is, I think, a very strong correlation on a lot of different levels for why this is the way it is. And we've tried to look at different ways that we can help stem this tide. But everything from access to health care, as well as environmental factors, and we have some of the highest asthma rates as well uh, in, in, in any other place in the nation. So we're seeing how all of those sort of negative factors, which have long existed and we've long spoken out against, and we've long looked for ways to stem that tide are now facing that unfortunate perfect storm where COVID-19 was the gasoline poured onto the fire that was already simmering. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why we see some of the highest fatality rates anywhere in the neighborhoods where I represent. I mean, at, in the evening, all I hear up and down the Grand Concourse are ambulance sirens going up and down. And, it, and it's so sad and it's so difficult uh, to hear that night after night because you know that behind every siren there's a person, there's a family, there's an issue involving someone uh, dealing with this crisis. Right. Well, give me a little bit about testing sites, because when we talk about testing sites, I know a lot of people have been trying to advocate we need more testing sites, and particularly in the areas where we're seeing high rates of infection and high mortality rates. 
it almost seems as though the testing site is absent. Exactly. I think there's been a lot of uh, systemic failures on the federal side at the very beginning of this crisis. And, you know, thankfully, through the hard work of Governor Cuomo and, and on the city level with the mayor and all of our local electives, we've been trying to sort of play catch up and have, you know, the level of cultural competency to be able to handle the need within our district. So there's been a lot of good work on in that regard. And you're starting to see some important things happening. And uh, through the, uh, the work on the state level, we're starting to see testing at NYCHA facilities, as well as distribution of, of uh, personal protective equipment and sanitizer. And we're going to try to get the most accurate uh, snapshot of what the COVID sort of load is in any particular neighborhood. And that's, I think, the only path forward is to be able to know exactly uh, what the percentages are of COVID in a particular neighborhood, do contact tracing to be able to see how that affects others around this individual, uh, and then eventually antibody testing, which will give, a, I think, a, a stronger indication of how widespread the virus was in the community and whether or not a certain segment of the population has a, a, a what would we what we would hope would be sort of an an innate immunity based on the fact that they were exposed already. There's a lot of unknowns with all of that. There's a lot that we just don't know. But I think, as as you mentioned, testing was missing in the very beginning. Um, and I think that now that we're starting to see more widespread testing over these past month and a half, you're starting to see a better accurate you know, description of where the highest caseloads are. Yeah, there were some pre-existing conditions in communities of color prior to COVID-19. And one of those things, uh, in addition to all of this, was food insecurity, right? Uh, when you look at our borough, uh, you can say in many, in many cases, food deserts in certain communities. Uh, and talk about this food insecurity, because this is still huge, and it becomes even more highlighted during a time like this. Well, just as you said... These problems aren't new to COVID. They've been there before. Food insecurity, uh, lack of healthy foods in our community um, have been an ongoing issue. I remember years ago uh, convening uh, sort of an ad hoc supermarket task force to try to find ways to bring healthier foods into our community. It seemed like we were losing supermarkets at such a high rate um, and we weren't, uh, our community didn't have access to fresh foods and vegetables and fruits and things that we know actually have a very positive effect on our health, lower health disparities, um, deal with things like hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. But unfortunately, these health disparities have persisted, and food insecurity has been a big part of that. Now that we're dealing with COVID, and we're experiencing and sort of mandating uh, that we have social distancing, that the most vulnerable of our population, which in many ways is, is the majority of people in our community, telling them to stay home, telling them to stay indoors, to stay away from others, a simple task like going to a supermarket now becomes a really tricky situation. A lot of people don't have the ability to get down to the supermarket to be able to get the healthy foods that they need. So now healthy uh, food insecurity becomes even more of an issue. Um, and I've been working with my colleagues in government uh, to try to find ways to get food to people. Thankfully, um, the state and local government have set up ways to get food delivered to our most vulnerable senior population. Again, it's not a perfect situation, but we're trying our best to improve it every day. Uh, and I think that that's going to be, you know, when we look back at all this, hopefully once we get through all of it and we start to think about all of the systemic failures that existed and how we can do better in the future. I think the fact that we are a food desert in many ways in our community, that we don't have the access to healthy fruits and vegetables as we should, this is going to be something that we're going to need to remedy uh, so that we can move forward in a much healthier way. Yeah, uh, a lot of there's going to be a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking when this is all through. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to take a look at, at whether or not we were really prepared for this pandemic. And obviously, from the federal to the state to the local level, the answer is going to be unequivocally no. But let's talk about resources, because in times like these, resources are needed. Uh, and in your in your senatorial district, 
Uh, what are the resources that are available, particularly for people who may be hungry or for people who may be experiencing some, ex uh, some severe challenges because of COVID-19? Well, there's a number of different things. And, and, and thankfully, uh, working with our, my colleagues in government, working with Governor Cuomo, who's been doing an amazing job uh, throughout all of this, working with uh, leaders on the, on the city level, the borough president, and everyone, uh, everyone has really stepped up to the plate in a very phenomenal way. Uh, and I'm so grateful for all of uh, the work that they're doing. And we're starting to see, a, a, thankfully, a decline in numbers. Uh, but again, we still have a long way to go and a lot of unknowns as we move forward. As far as resources go, uh, you know, trying to get food to, to individuals, testing PPE. Um, we've been getting a number of calls on unemployment insurance, people who have filed for unemployment, not able to, to get through on that system. A lot of that is being remedied right now. Um, but again, we've been handling calls and uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, and they've been sort of all over the map, everything from food insecurity to testing, uh, medical care, housing issues, concerns about rent, um, and also about uh, unemployment insurance and getting unemployment checks to the people who need them the most. Yeah. Before we get out of here, I know that there's a, a lot of concern about being able to get in touch with our elected officials during times like these. I know that per se the physical office is closed, but the work is going on for Bronxites who may be in your district. Why don't you just share a little bit about what's happening for you, how people can get in touch with you during this time of the season? Well, thank you for saying that. I mean, we've, because of social distancing and because of an, at an abundance of caution, we have the office uh, physically closed, but my staff is still working. So you can call our number 212-828-5829 and you can leave a message you will get a call back. You will get uh, issues. Uh, you will get results on issues that you're calling about. You can reach out to me on social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. A lot of people know how to reach me there uh, at Senator Serrano. You could send me messages there as well. But my staff, I feel truly blessed to be working with such a wonderful group of individuals who are so caring and so empathic for the community. And they're working day in and day out remotely to ensure that we're connecting individuals in our community with the services that they need. Um, and, and in our community, the need is great. And I think working with such a wonderful group of elected officials, I feel very blessed to have such wonderful colleagues here in the Bronx uh, and that they are all out there working very hard to ensure that we're doing all that we can for our seniors, for our most vulnerable population. Um, so again, feel free to reach out, 212-828-5829. Uh, we, we are there to help in any way we can. Yeah. State Senator Jose Serrano, thank you so much. It's been a long time since I had you actually had you on the show. It's great to have you back. And uh, certainly, we won't wait so long to bring you back again. No, please do. I've always enjoyed our conversations. And uh, thank you so much for having me and for all that you're doing. Hey, thanks a lot. State Senator Jose Serrano here with us here on Open Listen. We want you to stay with us. We do have more show coming up. We'll be right back right after this. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. And we're back here on Open. Darren Hyme here with you. We want to let you know that the coronavirus continues to affect families all across the globe. Many challenges for families trying to navigate and are in need of assistance. However, there are some things that are being done to assist families in this time. Here now to share a little bit about the resources that are available and things that can be done to help uh, is the Interim Executive Director of Little Essentials, Zakia Mohammed stevens and also the Executive Director of Power of Two, Erasma Monticello. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having us. 
Uh, glad to have you. Thank you. So when we talk about, you know, families actually being affected, uh, we know that at present people are stay at home, you know, moms and dads. Some people are really facing some real serious challenges, but you guys are really trying to do a great job in terms of bridging the gap. So please give us a little introduction as to who exactly your organization is. So um, Little Essentials um, offers families living in poverty with urgently needed supplies like car seat, diapers, wipes, pack and plays, bassinets. And we partner with a community of uh, our network of community partners that serve families directly. Um, so we know that here in New York City, um, it's really hard to get around without a car seat or a stroller or even have the diapers or other supplies that they need. Um, so we collect those donations from families all throughout New York City and we redistribute them to our partners. Yeah, yeah. And so talk to us as you're looking around during this time in this season. What are some of the immediate needs that you're seeing families need during this time? Um, the two key items are certainly diapers and wipes. Um, you have to figure since families are not leaving, those items like pack and plays and strollers aren't as essential as diapers and wipes. The families obviously go through many diapers throughout the day. And because of, you know, the current climate, you know, it's really hard to obtain those items at your local stores. Um, a lot of prices have raised, you know, so it's really hard for families to even obtain those items, even if they were to look for them in the stores. So um, a lot of times, we collect diapers throughout our um, warehouse and we have drives and, and that kind of thing. So we really try to definitely have those essential items because those are probably requested every single day throughout the day as well. Yeah. Erasmus, a little bit about Power of Two. Sure. So Power of Two is a nonprofit organization. And what we do is that we promote the healthy trajectories of children in family with um, and children and families in Brownsville in the South Bronx. And we do that by delivering an in-home parent coaching program. Uh, what we do is that we take a strengths-based approach to racial justice at Power of Two, partnering with parents to build their confidence, reduce their stress, build a strong foundation for success for their children, and also, you know, really trying to do that in a way that um, strengthens communities. And so we provide our services for free to all families, wherever they may be, in a shelter, in public housing, transitional housing, a group home, or foster care. And when we talk about families, right, a lot of families are dealing with stress and doing, dealing with the stress of the quarantine. Talk to me about babies, right, development mm -hmm. and their development during such a time as this, because it's a critical time. But, right. you know, everybody's like, you know, trying to trying to basically in survival mode, talk mm -hmm. about developing babies during this time. Yeah, I mean, you know, we hear regularly in the media and everywhere else that oh, we're in a global health crisis. For us, we see it as a human crisis, right? I mean, you know, when you think about like the Harvard Center for the Developing Child often says that cumulative stress can be pictured like a freight truck, right? The load of a freight truck. The trucks are built to carry a certain load, but when it reaches its maximum capacity or exceeds it, the truck has difficulty functioning, right? So in this context where we already, our communities are, um, affected by decades of disinvestment. We're living in under-resourced communities. There's exposure to violence. You know, there's abuse and neglect. And now the fallout of COVID-19, there, you know, a family's ability to cope just becomes even more difficult. And so recognizing that this additional re-traumatization is having this negative impact, not only on the, on the caregiver and their stress levels, but, you know, children have receptors and whatever they see their parents experiencing, they also feel it. And so it can affect our generation for who knows how long if we don't do something now. Yeah, it's a kid I, I'm talking about resources, right? We're talking about getting resources out uh, to families in need, to you know those who really are are really challenged. How are you able to do this now, given the fact that COVID nineteen has played uh, has played a major part in disrupting all of our environment? No, absolutely. So we are um, working on a very modified schedule um, as Power of Two is one of our partners and working remotely um, and certainly is bringing a real challenge because normally our protocol enables um, our partners to come directly to our warehouse and pick up orders for their clients. But as a result from a lot of remote work, um, they're unable to do that. 
Um, so that's, you know, in terms of, you know, getting the orders directly to families. Again, we've had to suspend our in-person donations. So our inventory has also significantly um, been reduced. Um, and we've had to cancel our annual gala. So um, just all of those factors have really, um, you know, put a play into how we have to you know, move forward in the future. Um, but we are making sure that we are doing our best to fulfill all requests. So even if they're not from our network of community partners, um, if individual families contact us, we still are taking the time to really understand what they need and really assess their inventory to figure out a way to get them um, the items that they need the most. Yeah, yeah. And so remote is virtual has been the order of the day. I mean, for, for both of you. Uh, Erasmus, tell me a little bit about, you know, being able to navigate this virtually. I mean, it's hard for parents. It's hard for, you know, and, and if a parent hasn't been technologically savvy before, That's of right. course, a more increased burden. I see you shaking your head like, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. So, you know, as an organization that really strongly believes in human connection, you know, we're, we're committed to ensuring that all families um, we, that we partner with continue to thrive. And so what we've done is that we've taken our in-person model mm -hmm. and created what we call tele-ABC. So they were able to provide the, con the continual, um, you know, strengthening the families virtually via a, a Zoom healthcare platform. And so the goal is to really be able to continue to connect with families while simultaneously helping them buffer their children from the stress. Um, and also what we try to do is with families that don't have connectivity, right? So they don't have access to a laptop or a tablet or are having difficulty connecting to broadband. We've been doing a lot of fundraising and working directly with a lot of foundations so that we can um, increase our funding so that we can provide those actual connectivity points for families. Because it's not just only about connecting with our program, it's also giving them an opportunity to continue socialization, right? Socializing with their friends, with their families, and, and actually be able to connect to the resources that have all shifted online. Yeah, Erasmus, thank you, but before we go, uh, I'm going to let you and then I'll, I'll let you start first and then Zakia can come on and talk about how people can get connected to your organization, even at times such as this. Absolutely. So um, people can certainly still give us a call. Um, they can visit our website at littleessentials.org. We're going to be exploring more ways that we can, you know, have drives outside of our warehouse um, to do a lot more outdoor events. Um, we are in the midst of a COVID relief campaign, so people can certainly still donate um, because we really want to ensure that we can sustain our operations. Um, and so people can certainly give us a call and reach out, you know, via phone or info at littleessentials.org if they want to connect to us. Alrighty. Yeah, and and for us, um, families can reach out to us at three four seven five five nine one five one nine. They can certainly visit us at our website at www.powerof2.nyc, where they can also have access to emergency resources information. And for those that are interested in, in donating, visit our website or follow us on Twitter at powerof2.nyc. Um, and we'll be able to share more information about how you can make those important donations to really help us buffer our families from this human crisis. Well, I want to thank you guys both for coming and sharing with us here on Open. You're doing some great work. And uh, hopefully as COVID-19 continues to hopefully diminish, uh, we can see your work continue to increase. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having us. Thank All you. Right. All right, Zakia Razma, thank you so much. Listen, we've got more Open. I want you to stay with us. We are coming right back, right after this. It looks bleak. It feels bleak. But the city isn't shut down because our public services keep working. In spite of, and in the face of, the dangers, we can count on them. And to keep them working and funded, now and in the future, we need to be counted. Self-respond now to the 2020 Census at my2020census.gov. And thank you for staying with us. Well, in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19, social distancing measures were introduced. And with social distancing measures being introduced, a lot of people have been impacted, particularly relationships. And the quarantine has had a specific effect on relationships, dating, the whole nine yards. And how do you kind of like navigate and date possibly during quarantine? How do you navigate and have a good relationship during quarantine? Well, we're pleased to be joined by a very special guest. She's a 
relations expert, and she's also the host of, uh, or she said, I should say, the author of Diving in Stilettos. Maybe I just, you know, forecasted a TV show or something like that. But Shante Dunbar is here, and uh, yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm navigating. I'm navigating. I think you're going to help us to navigate well today. Yes, absolutely. I'm here for it. Well, good. So come on and help me. Now, listen, a lot of people are really struggling during this time. And, you know, when we talk about social distancing, you know, for those extroverts and people who really, you know, like being out, uh, yeah. and, you know, it's really a challenge and relationships are, are, are a big part of that. So talk to us about how this is really affecting relationships. It is extremely. I think this is the time, especially if you have been with your significant other for a while, this can actually make or break your relationship. Like a lot of people are quarantined together for the first time, spending all this time together, husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, and they're really seeing a person's like day to day. And it's either going to, you know, make you say, well, wow, like you're really amazing. I had no idea you did all that. Or you're really getting on my nerves and I just need some space and <laughs> yes. need yeah. to figure this out. So I've been helping a lot of people with cope with, you know, being together in the same space for long periods of time. And to those who don't get to see their significant other, you know, who have long distance relationships and like it's even, you know, they feel feeling more pressure now because now they really can't go and visit you know, the person whenever they want to. And then, of course, my singles out there who are just trying to figure it out all together. And some are dabbling in online dating. So. Right. So walk me through that, because I hear this is an emerging trend right now, that people are really, you know, starting this online dating thing. We're going we're gonna to try it virtually and see if it works first. And if it works first, then we'll, we'll see about meeting in person. This is, this is really real. Yeah, it's really real. And honestly, it's like the best method. I wish people practiced this kind of dating, you know, before they, you know, got out there and just started randomly meeting people um, from the online dating apps. You know, now it's the opportunity to really talk to the person, connect mentally, see how, you know, the person lives. Maybe you could get like tours of their house. <laughs> <laughs> that situation's about and the beauty of it is there's no catfishing like you have to be who you really are because when it's time for that FaceTime date that video chat you know it's gonna be real so I, I can set up zoom and put up like a virtual background I mean I can get through that <laughs> <laughs> that'll work for a little while but it's like what are you hiding <laughs> right 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 that could let be me like see a your... cute theme date like let's go to Paris today I right. get it but if I'm really trying to get to know somebody I'm gonna need to see like you know where you have tape <laughs> yeah yeah but uh, on a serious note though in addition to all these you know good things happening in terms of relationships on another side we do see like domestic violence and, yes. and arguments and things like that that are that are on the rise right here. Have you gotten reports and have you gotten people to really uh you know say that this is the issue going on too? Well, I've heard from a couple of people that, you know, they're really struggling in the relationship. I haven't heard anything about like physical abuse, but the emotional and mental abuse is just as bad. And unfortunately a lot of these people don't have anywhere else to go because they you know the person that they might go to might be elderly or you know they just don't have room for them so that's kind of something that's really hard to deal with but you know I say you have to like call on your friends and see who can like help you out and if you don't have friends there are helplines that you can call and they can find places for you to go because you know nobody wants to stay in a home where they're being abused you know that's not healthy like at all right. so definitely right. reach out you have to reach out to the help the helplines and then also like i advise people like check on your strong friends like some people get in their feelings like oh, nobody's calling me and i don't understand why this person's not reaching out and it's like maybe they can't mm -hmm. so instead of being self-absorbed maybe you can do the reaching out just go around and check on people and see what they need and how you can help them you know? Yeah. What are some of the common mistakes people are making during this season? <laughs> Not talking. Okay. 
not communicating, running around the house with attitudes, you know, being in silence rather than saying, you know, I need a little space right now. Or when I have my headphones on, you know, I'm in a zone. Could you just give me that moment of peace by myself, you know? But, you know, people aren't saying anything or they're talking to other people about their problems rather than the person that they have the problem with. Kind of what was happening before COVID. <laughs> right, right. It's more intense right. now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that things become a little bit more intense, but, you know, let's talk about from a relationship perspective, like even with families, right? Yeah. I may not have seen my kid for a minute, and and that's a relationship, that's a relationship in itself. I may not have seen, you know, those people mm-hmm. who I, I live with under my roof. Yeah. Now I'm seeing them every day, every day. <laughs> Yeah, it's an adjustment. Like, I shout out to those parents who are homeschooling. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a special kind of power you have going on right there, discovering, you know. So, um, like I said, it's about, you know, communicating and not making it stressful for the people in the house, right? This is an opportunity that you get to really spend time with these people. So, why not make the best of it? Like, play games and puzzles and draw and paint with the kids like it's not all about like stay on top of your schoolwork school is done for the rest of the year okay Mm -hmm. and you weren't teaching them before so don't you know come stressing them out now because you feel like they're they're gonna dumb down if you don't you know enforce this reading on them right now you know kids are going through stuff too you don't know what they're seeing and you know what comes up on the internet so it's like everybody just take it easy. This is a time for us to like step back and reevaluate some things so that when we do get back out there, you know, we have a new perspective and we come out like better people. So. Yeah. Speaking about take it easy, I think some people are learning how to take it easy. There's something called virtual happy hour. I mean, I, I'm, I'm learning, you know, yes. I mean, listen, this stuff is, this stuff is real. <laughs> so I take it that you have virtual happy hour. Yeah. Have you, have... There's virtual happy hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've had to slow down on the virtual happy hour. <laughs> They're like, what's in your cup? Lemon water. I need to detox and heal. Like, it's just too much. <laughs> you know, but there's also also uh, virtual book clubs that, you know, people are starting to become a part of. And I think that's really cool. People are, like, tapping in. They're doing trivia nights um, virtually. So it's a lot of ways to, like, connect. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, cool. and so like so there's book clubs, there's virtual. Um, what else is out there that maybe people can get connected to in a time such as this? Because yeah, people do need a detox and a detachment. Yes, absolutely. So I say join a virtual book club, join um, an exercise class. There's live exercise classes that you can do on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> these these trainers are out here and they still want to like keep you healthy. So why not, you know, hit your friend up and y'all take a class together. There's virtual cooking classes that you can do. There's paint and sips that you can do. Order some materials off of Amazon. I mean, order now because who knows when you're going to get them. But right. <laughs> you know, right. just make the effort to want to be more social. And like I said, of course, um, there's movie nights. You guys can like get together, FaceTime, and be critics watching the movies. So there's tons of ways to do it. It's just think about all the things that you love doing and put it online with your friends. Before we go, listen real quickly. You got a cooking demo, huh? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on <laughs> so what had happened was right okay so i usually am one that i'm rarely ever home right so eating out is something that i did quite often and you know my bank account did not appreciate that so what this quarantine has done is saved me a lot of money because now i you know when i go to the grocery store i stock up and i'm vegetarian so i needed to learn how to really cook these meals that I keep buying that are so expensive. So I teamed up with celebrity chef uh, Rashawn and um, he's a part of Infinite Catering. And we were like, you know what? These couples are out here. You know, they're trying to figure out ways to keep the peace. Like cooking together is something that's so fun and, you know, you get a delicious meal out of it. So why not learn these new things that you wanted to before Learned them now. So, yeah, I've been chefing it up, and it's been delicious. 
<laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad. Listen, we want people to get connected to you. Go to divingstilettosfirst.com and uh, you can get connected to Shantae, find out all that she's doing. And thanks a lot for coming and hanging out with us, giving us a little advice. And hopefully somebody's got some peace or some love in the home because of this. <laughs> I, I hope so. If not, they can check out um, my page and check out my Coin Twain Love Experiment. I'm monitoring five couples, five singles, how they're doing throughout this entire entire. Uh, season is what I call it. And yeah, we give out coaching tips and it's a great opportunity. So you're not alone. Oh. We're all in this together. That's it. Well, Shante, as always, a joy having you coming to share with us here on Open. Uh, we got to go taking a quick break. We're going to have some more show with you. We're coming right back right after this. In this war, we must plan forward for the next battle. The next battle is the apex. The next battle is on the top of the mountain. And that's what we're planning for every day. The number of testing has increased. The more you test, the more good you're doing. Change in number of discharged, line is going up. Why? More people going in, more people treated, more people coming out. We will be at a different place. Our challenge is to make sure that transformation and that change is positive and not negative. Let's make sure we're taking the positive lesson and not the negative lesson. Do you get up smarter? Do you get up wiser? Or do you get up bitter? Do you get up angry? We are in control of that. And we have to start to think about that. And we also have to be smarter from what we went through. And welcome back here to Open. Darren Hyme here with you. And as we are bringing you the news, the information, the things that you need to know, of course, we here at Open have had to change our format and go virtually uh, because, of course, due to coronavirus, we are social distancing and practicing social distancing. And so a lot of things, a lot of adjustments uh, people are having to make. And it's not just adults, but it's also children as well. And so we talk about the coronavirus pandemic. Children are actually trying to navigate uh, the pandemic. And one of the things they can do is they can get off track from their life, their mission, and their goals. And so got a very special guest to talk to us a little bit about uh, how she's helping uh, Bronx students be able to reach their goals and objectives. She's the author of books. And uh, we've got a Bronx educator and author, Whitney Smith, joining us. And uh, Whitney, good to have you. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Hey, so... Uh, Tell us a little bit about this, because, I mean, you've been really entrenched with Bronx students. And prior to COVID-19, you were really spending some time uh, trying to encourage them and keep them on their life path. Well, you know, it's a difficult time for all of us. Right. And um, the kids in general, um, they are having difficulties with staying in the house and having to be confined to their homes. And what I try to do now, not what I try to do, but what we do as far as our Zoom classes, we have the online classes that we make them interactive as possible, but not just teaching them about, you know, English language arts, but also having those conversations about their feeling where they are emotionally um, and giving them suggestions. Well, I give them suggestions on what they can do to help them combat, not combat, but to help to deal with this self-isolation. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, coming from prior to this situation, it was a lot of interaction, a little, a lot of, um, you know, events that we would have to keep them engaged. So now we're finding these ways to keep them engaged and keep their minds, you know, going and at ease um, at the same time, trying to have some type of a, you know, connection with them. Yeah. Get to that place of, you know, I think we have to call it normalcy, but it's not normalcy. No. How do you get, how do you get them adaptive? And, and so one of the things that you did was you actually wrote a book and it actually is good for a time such as this, right? And the book is called, yeah. So you got the book called Don't Drop Out On You and uh, there it is right there. So for people who don't know about Don't Drop Out On You, talk about it. Sure. You know what I want to say before this COVID-19 situation, um, I created a, a campaign, my co-author and I, Dwayne, and this campaign was to basically get the this book in the hands of the students at my school. So mm -hmm. 120 kids were able to get Don't Drop Out on You mm -hmm. and able to read it, actually read it during this time of self-isolation. Okay. So the good thing, wow. Don't Drop Out on You basically is to encourage um, 
youth and young adults on not dropping out on them when life gets hard, when those circumstances mm -hmm. hit, um, when they feel as if they're not doing well in school as far as, you know, grades, but also not just academically, but emotionally and spiritually. And it's so, uh, such a time as this, mm -hmm. as far as the title, Don't Drop Out on You, can help them maneuver and navigate through these challenges. Like, don't give up. I know you feel like, you know, it's the end and I'm not going to be able to be connected to my friends, you know, um, um, outside of social media, but able to have that connection, but don't drop out on yourself and just encouraging them. So that's exactly what this book is about. No yeah. drop out on you. Well, and, and part of it, you talk about meeting the authentic you, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and so what do you mean by the, so so let's talk about meeting the authentic you, right? So what what is the authentic you? Okay, well, authenticity or being authentic is unique to the individual. So whatever that means to you, you know, that means to you. But as far as authentic, being yourself, not uh, second guessing who you are. And sometimes we will have those doubts, but knowing that who, who God made you to be, created mm -hmm. you to be, that's who you should be. You know, be honest with yourself, value yourself, and just um, accept who you are because you're the only person that can do you better than anyone else. Right. And you're okay. So that authenticity, being unique, being creative, being, you know, who you are. And so you've got a lot of helps for people, right? You got the, you know, being an authentic you and don't drop out on you. I think yes. you you is this you is the central focus. But for students, right, that's a hard, mm -hmm. that's a hard challenge sometimes to 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 navigate. And they're also the age of actually becoming, right? You're you're that's finding right. out who you are. That's right. And act I, I teach eighth grade, so that's uh 13, 14 students. So this is a critical age because it's like we said, you're always becoming, but at this stage, they are experimenting with who they are. They don't know who they are, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and I, what I do is I try to, even with the books, it encourages them to find out who you are. And that's, you're going to fail at some things. You're going to like some things one day, and then you're going to shift. And that's okay to value the experience. So you want to, so the thing is that, um, Eventually, all the experiences and um, their encounters um, will help them with becoming. So we encourage we I this book and all my educators in my school, and we encourage um, them to, you know, find out who you are by your experiences. And it's right. okay if you don't know. Yeah, no yeah. Record. Yeah. Real, real quick before we go, gotta give you a few seconds. Tell me very quickly about the college cheat sheet. Okay. Also. I tell about the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's a college <laughs> memoir. My experience, uh, I'm not going to say about 10 years ago. I'm telling my age. But basically, I just talk about the experiences I had um, academically, personally. And I really go into the things that you don't, that you can't find. Well, you probably can find it. But the things that people don't talk about, the college experience, you mm -hmm. know, or these fraternities, uh, credit, um, as, you know, Back in my day, I sound old. Back in my day, um, the credit card com companies were able to come on campus and say, "Here you go." You know, they can't do that anymore. But anyway, but my the financial um, the financial woes, the good experiences, the relationship encounters, how I was finding out who I was and what I liked and what I didn't like, internships. So I talk about a whole host of things in the college memoir, basically my experience to help someone else. Well, you helped a lot of people. You got two books out there, college, cheat sheet. Listen, thank Three. you so much for coming. Three, there you go, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> Undercut you there. But thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. Uh, if people you. want to get in touch with you, I am Whitney D. Smith on Instagram, and you've got other ways that we can get connected to you. Thank you so much for being with us here on Open. Thank you. We got more show coming up right after this. We'll be right back. Who is most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65. People with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov.
And thank you for staying with us. PSS Circle of Care is continuing to serve the Bronx caregiving community during the pandemic with online services, hotline support groups, educational webinars, and also doing a whole variety of different things to make sure that people can stay connected, particularly to support older adults as well as family caregivers. And here joining us a little bit more to talk a little bit about it is Sonia Shute, and she is from Family uh, I should say from PSS Circle. Thank you so much for being with us, Sonia, and sharing with us. Thank you so for, much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Sonia Shoot. I'm the Senior Director of PSS Circle of Care. Uh, PSS Circle of Care is our caregiver support program. So we provide support to caregivers who are caring for someone who is ill, elderly, frail, um, or experiencing memory loss. And in addition, we provide support mm -hmm. to caregivers, um, kinship caregivers. So caregivers, oftentimes grandparents that are raising grandchildren. No, I was, I was just going to just jump in because when you talk about grandparents raising grandchildren, uh, you know, first of all, in its own, that's rough. But then now with COVID-19, a lot to have to navigate through. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, our team has done an incredible job of reaching out and providing support, not only to the grandparents, so the and all of the kinship caregivers um, in the in the way of support groups and regular wellness checks and regular check ins and counseling sessions. Um, but we've also been providing direct support to the kinship youth as well. So um, we've hosted a uh, virtual support group exclusively for those youth. So they have an opportunity to, you know, really reconnect. And um, we're really hoping to address some of the isolation that all of us are experiencing right now. Yeah. Um, and so and so yeah. can you give me a little bit about navigating through that? Because when you talk about isolation, big thing, right? A lot of people are dealing with this distancing and isolation. How do you navigate you know, these caregivers during such a time as this, because we rely a lot on, or caregivers rely a lot on that, that, that touch and that being connected. Absolutely. And um, particularly if you think about a caregiver who's caring for someone who's experiencing Alzheimer's or dementia, oftentimes those caregivers are relying on their network of support. So, um, all of our caregivers, in fact, are relying on that network of support. So they're relying on their neighbor or their friend or that home care aide that comes in and provides them with that, that critical time off and respite that they need. But under the current social quarantine protocols, um, they are no longer able to access that support. So they are now um, oftentimes working in that caregiver role, um, just them. Right. So it makes our support groups um, more critical than ever. So PSS Circle of Care has always offered the support groups, um, but what we did very quickly is made all of our support groups virtual. So we're using a variety of platforms, um, but we have found that Zoom's been particularly effective. So if there is a caregiver out there and they're interested in it, participating in a support group specifically for caregivers, um, we have many of them going on at uh, various times of the day, various times of the week. Um, and all that information is available on our website, um, which is pss.usa.org. Uh, um, but yes, support groups have become particularly important during this time. In addition, our staff are working very hard to maintain regular check-ins. So we're doing regular wellness checks. Um, you know, just making sure that people are coping okay, that they have the resources that they need, that they have access to food. Um, food security is a particularly uh, relevant issue right now for so many New Yorkers, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and also that they have the medicine that they need. So our staff and our team is working incredibly hard to make sure that those supports are in place. Yeah, can we go a little bit further into the meals? Because meals are a big thing, right? And so... Uh, being able to eat and, and, and Meals on Wheels, we know, is something that uh, many people are familiar with. But, you know, this grab and go uh, is also yes. available as well. Yeah. So our um, PSS, in addition to our caregiver support program, um, they were they we also oversee um, our senior director of older adults, over, older adult services oversees um, 10 senior centers in the Bronx and Manhattan. And um, 
you know, our senior centers did a real, our centers did an incredible job of really um, continuing to provide meals uh, for a significant period of time um, by virtue of grab and go. So center members were able to come to the center and uh, pick up a meal to take back to their um, plate, their home um, while maintaining social distancing protocols. Um, so that was a really incredible service that we were able to provide um, for a, a period of time. Yeah. Dementia patients are really big during this season too as well. What's the process in terms of trying to deal with those who are caregivers and dealing with those who are affected with dementia? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, if you think about it, those caregivers are in a particularly difficult position during this time because um, as fulfilling as it is to be a caregiver, caring for someone who's affected by Alzheimer's or dementia can be a very difficult and stressful role. Um, but particularly when we are um, in our apartments all the time. And as I mentioned before, you know, those caregivers would usually be relying on their network of support. So their friends, their families, their neighbors. But in this instance, they're unable to do that. So that's where the role of caregiving programs such as PSS Circle of Care become more important. Um, but there, there really are some very, very real challenges associated um, with, with being a caregiver of someone affected by dementia. Uh, at this time. And I think it's important that caregivers are connecting with each other to know, to really understand that they're not alone and that there are other caregivers going through something similar. And again, I think just having the staff who follow up regularly to check in to see if they're doing okay and, uh, you know, what supports that can be put in place and what can we do um, to better support caregivers in their home. Yeah. Before we go real quickly, got about a minute left, but talk to us a little bit about that webinar because that webinar yes. is very important. Absolutely. Um, so we have a COVID-19 webinar coming up. It's taking place on Thursday, April 30th from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And it's called COVID-19 Update on What Older Adults Need to Know. It's um, the second in a two-part, uh, or it's a follow-up session of a, of a second two-part series in which um, Dr. Arkna Chopra, who's a fellow in geriatric medicine um, at Weill Cornell, is going to share new and updated medical guidance on the coronavirus. So she's gonna be providing very relevant and pertinent information. Um, and then again, that's taking place on Thursday, April 30th from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and anyone who's interested in participating in that webinar can go to our website at www pssusa.org backslash events. Yeah, so, and then we just have so many really, really great relevant uh, webinars and events taking place. So I would just encourage caregivers in particular, but anyone really who's looking to access support during this crisis and during this pandemic, we have some really incredible um, webinars taking place. And all of that, you're able, they're all free, accessible, and uh, people can register online. All righty. Well, Sonia, shoot, we got to leave it there. But I want to tell people for more information, you can visit the website at pssusa.org or call 866-665-1713. Sonia, shoot, our guest, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All righty. And we want to tell you that about wraps it up for another edition of Open. want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. want to thank all of our guests for joining us. Now, listen, if you want to catch the Recablecast, be sure to check it out, 5 and 10 p.m., uh, Channel 67, that, that's BronxNet. Uh, if you want to catch us on the Verizon Files, that's Channel 33, or anytime on the web at BronxNet.org. For all of us here on Open, we want to say thank you. God bless. Darren Jaime saying take care. We'll see you soon. Rita Valentine will be up on Friday with a brand new episode. Until then, take care.